Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm doing well. Happy Monday. Are you in San Francisco or is that just your background? I wish I was in San Fran right now. <laughs> That's just my background. <laughs> <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Monday. I wish I was in San Fran. <laughs> <laughs> Meet you guys for one second. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Christine Kim, and I'm the founder and a board member of My Dog is My Home. I'm joining you from the unceded territory of the Canarsie and Muncie Lenape people, otherwise known as Queens, New York. As we are all getting, uh, as we are all getting settled in here, please feel free to put in the chat your name and where you are from and what organization you are representing. I encourage you all to also acknowledge the unceded territory from where you are joining, and if you need it, I will join. I will drop in the link, um, I'm sorry, I will drop in the chat a link that you can use uh, to look up the territories and its native peoples. So there we go. It is in the chat now for you all to access. And again, uh, just as we're getting settled in here, please feel free to put in the chat your name and where you're from and what organization you're representing. So great to see you all here and thank you so much for joining our event, which is called Office Hours Ask a Dog Trainer. My Dog is My Home will be holding various types of office hours events throughout the year. Office hours are an open format Q&A opportunity for you to ask questions and troubleshoot issues with an expert on a specific topic. Today's office hours event is about dog training and behavior in a congregate living environment. And the intention is to help you workshop your concerns as they relate to policies, procedures, and practices at your own emergency shelter or housing sites. Our expert joining us today is Jen Biglin. Jen, uh, KPACTP, is a member of the Karen Pryor Academy faculty. She leads the Dog Trainer Professional Program and is herself a graduate of the program. Oops, I'm getting a little bit of feedback here. So if I can remind folks uh, to just put yourselves on mute as you join us. Thank you so much. Let's see here, where did I leave off? Uh, Jen has loved all things furry since her childhood, which included summers spent riding and caring for horses in Arizona. Jen earned a bachelor's degree from the University of Oregon. In 2016, Jen and a business partner launched Training Spot, a 4,000 square foot facility dedicated to community education, positive training, and improving the human animal relationship. Training Spot has a training team of seven trainers and growing, and offers more than 35 classes a week, including group classes, private lessons, behavior consultations, and a unique video channel for current and past clients. A certified, a certified dog behavior consultant, as well as a KPA certified training partner, Jen's natural talent for understanding, addressing, and alleviating fearful and aggressive tendencies in dogs has earned her the respect of local veterinarians and the community. We are obviously very lucky to have Jen join us today. So thank you so much, Jen, for lending your time and your expertise. Thank you for that introduction. I appreciate it. You're very welcome. And with that, I won't delay us any further. Everyone, please feel free to drop your questions in the chat for Jen. We will get through as many of them as we can during this office hour session. And while people are formulating their thoughts, I have a question to kick us off with. Uh, Jen, everyone is here because they're either currently co-sheltering people and animals together, thinking about co-sheltering people and animals together, or they are representing an animal organization or business and they want to help support shelter providers, um, I should clarify, homeless shelter providers with the effort of sheltering people and together. 
And I would say that most, if not all parties, share one big concern, and that's that they're afraid that a dog is going to bite someone. Uh, so let's go ahead and start with that big ticket item. How can homeless shelter providers and the animal welfare professionals supporting the homeless shelter programs best mitigate the risk of dog bites in a congregate shelter environment? Yeah, that's a great question. And, uh, and I'll just add to all the many things that Christine said about my bio that I am also on the board of our local Humane Society and have collaborated um, both with the very large fire that uh, the Eugene Springfield Lane County area um, experienced a mass evacuation. And so I was a big part of coordinating and collaborating on that response. And so sheltering animals both um, during crisis as well as um, with people who are experiencing homelessness is something that's very, very important to me. And I've had a lot of experience with both um, our, with our local uh, uh, shelter, but as well as emergency situations. So that's why I'm grateful to be here. And thank you for all your time and all the hard work that you're all doing. Um, you know, if preventing dog bites is, is a very big question. I think that, you know, it can be really helpful for, communities that are bringing animals in to just have some very simple basic rules for on campus, like while dogs or cats are on campus. And some of those things can be um, just very, very simple, like not allowing dog-dog greetings while animals on property. So sure, you're, you know, Fluffy wants to go play with, um, you know, I don't know, uh, Lucy. And so that you can take that off property if you want to do that introduction, but you could just have some, some simple policies like we don't do dog dog greetings on the campus so that you're establishing that routine of when you're here, dogs aren't greeting. Although dogs are very social and it can be really fun to have play, people don't necessarily always make great choices around that. And then it's also a really high stress situation depending on the environment that they're in. So just having some simple um you know, dog, no dog dog greetings and potentially no uh, human dog greetings. Like if it's not your dog, you know, don't go pet it. There's a lot of pressure for people to want to go pet other dogs. And a lot of times pet parents will just say yes, even though the dog may be, be giving signals that they do not want to greet. Um, and that, that can be a really um, uh, just cause a bite because if the dog is in its space and somebody's coming up into its space, if it's on leash or if it's in a crate or it's behind a barrier, the dog can't move away. So you're more likely to have a bite. So I think it, having that rule of just, you don't play with other people's dogs on the campus. You don't go let other people's dogs out of crates or kettles. You have certain people or just the pet parents who are allowed to do that is one way to really reduce bites. In general, a dog coming in um, to a shelter environment, depending on the situation, is going to be stressed. And so anytime stress is elevated, you're more likely to get a bite. And you're going to, going to see a couple of different responses from the dog. You're either going to see a dog who's going to try to proactively get you to move out of their space, or you're going to see a dog who really, really shuts down and gets really scared. And both dogs are you know, potentially experiencing the same thing, fear, but they're going to have very different responses. Um, it, if you have the resources, it can be really helpful to educate shelter staff about body language and how dogs communicate because they are a different species and they have a different language than us. Oftentimes just having some good access to dog body language videos so you can, you yourself can see what the dog is trying to communicate more quickly will also help uh, mitigate bites because usually dogs will try to tell you by putting their ears down, moving away, looking away, um, that they're uncomfortable. Um, and oftentimes we just, we aren't paying attention or we, we don't see those things as signals for us to move away. And so then the dog is sort of forced to escalate in some of those situations. Uh, so education on dog body language would also be really helpful. Um, Jen, to that point, uh, I would love to bring up a resource that is available for free online around dog body language. So um, 
I think it is a lot to ask um, shelter staff and then also all of the residents to like take a course or watch a video mm -hmm. even on dog body language, but there are some free downloadable posters that can just be printed and then posted in common areas or given to staff and put in their offices um, that use really accessible sort of fun and cute uh, drawings that illustrate dog body language and like what a stressed dog looks like or what a happy dog looks like as well. Yeah. Um, and so uh, one of those resources, I think Lily Chin, the artist, has some mm -hmm. free um, posters that are downloadable and you can just print them right there. Um, and then another one I want to say is like Kettle Dog Publishing. Um, if you Google that, they do have some posters on their website that you can also download and print. Yeah, Lily Chen has very extensive library and she has handouts and they're they're fabulous. Absolutely. Um, and that's why, you know, if your resources are limited, just having a, you know, hands to yourself policy where you're not going and petting somebody else's dog, because even a fearful dog might approach you. And so that makes us feel like, oh, they want to come say hi, but they don't necessarily, they might just be wanting to take in more scent or check you out a little bit. And so it can feel like an invitation, but it isn't always. All right, great. And then um, another question sort of related to the dog bite issue or fear of dog bites. Um, Jen, would you recommend that there be a muzzle policy or what are your thoughts around muzzles? Mm. Um, that is a great question. I'm not a huge fan of muzzles unless it's for a short period of time. Um, you know, if you had an emergency situation where this was the best safest way to keep a dog and a, and a ham, you know, it's pet parent safe, then I would say sure for a situational period of time, but you have to be, but shell, muzzles can be stressful. Ideally you're getting the dog comfortable with the muzzle. So I really am more of a big fan of the muzzle up if we're, you know, thinking like, Hey, we, this dog needs emergency medical care, or we really need to, um, you know, how's this person temporarily, you know, situations like that, that'll be shorter term, but the muzzle can be stressful if it's not trained properly. Um, and then we want to make sure that if we were having a dog wear a muzzle for more than an hour, I mean, even maybe 30 minutes that it's a basket muzzle. So there's basket muzzles that go around and allows the dog to eat and drink and pant and fully open its mouth because dogs can't sweat. Um, so they, they, dissipate heat through their, through panting and through the paw pads. Um, you'll see other muzzles, which are like grooming muzzles or vets will use often if they have a procedure that they need to do and it, it keeps the mouth closed. Those are just for short, really short uh, periods of time. So if you need it, it's not a bad idea to have them on hand just in case. Um, and they do actually have little emergency muzzles that, muzzles that come in a little package that you can get um, that can be really nice for, for emergencies if you need it to get a dog in and out of a space safely. Um, but otherwise, uh, using muzzles situationally for short periods of time is preferable. Great. Thank you for that sound advice, Jen. Um, so I see two questions in the chat here, one from, or a couple questions from Heather and Heather, I'm going to actually put a pin in these questions and come back around to them towards the end. Um, but we have a, a nice question for this moment in time from Chrissy. How can we work around staff who are scared of dogs? Hmm. Hmm. That's a good question. In general, I think one of the things that I would recommend, whether you have an animal shelter, whether you have an emergency shelter, or whether you're working um, in a uh, situation where you're co-housing people and animals, having patterns and designated people who are comfortable working with animals is probably your best idea. And so uh, what I mean by pattern is here's where you first come when you are bringing an animal in and then here's where you go next and here's where you go next. So for example, if you were housing um, dogs in an emergency situation, you would have an entry and an entry door an exit door. So people are funneling in the right direction. So you don't have dogs going in and out the same door if possible. Um, and then have people who are designated to, to assist with those animals 
or if that's not possible, have, use barriers. So what we want to think about when we're working with animals is that they're going to perceive their environment through um, sound, smell, sight, taste, and through touch. And so some things that we can do to make things less stressful, especially if you have, a, you know, let's say you have somebody at the desk who is a, is afraid of animals. Maybe you have a, an X pen or a baby gate or some type of physical barrier so that when people are coming in, that keeps the animal further away. Um, or maybe you have a little holding pen that they go into over here so that while the person who is handling them is filling out paperwork, there's a little pen for the dog to go into. And you just have a pattern of like dogs come in here, cats go over here um, to create some physical separation to keep everybody safe. And somebody had asked the question about, and I know it, it can be a tricky um, situation to say, for example, you, you come in for the night and you need to go take a shower and do you leave your dog unattended? And so I think every, every situation is different. Um, and in general, I try to reduce stress for the dog because that's going to reduce stress for everybody else. So some dogs could come in, go to a crate that's next to their person's bed um, because proximity to their person is going to be less stressful for both the dog and the per and the owner, usually. Um, and they might just sleep really, really well or be really, really quiet in the crate. And then they could go use the restroom and come back and it would be fine. Other dogs are going to have separation anxiety, which means that they're very distressed that their pet parent is out of the way. And they're going to scream and howl, which is going to cause stress for all the other pets in that environment. And so, you know, you could have a policy where your animal has to be able to be quiet in an unattended space. Um, although I think that might eliminate a lot of situation in an emergency situation, that's not going to be an option. Um, so you might have in the restroom, again, a little, little pen or you have a you know, safe place where they go in. So somebody goes into the restroom, the dog goes into this little holding area, um, maybe that's um, a certain restroom, maybe it's a certain corner, um, the dog goes in there, they go use the restroom. When you have a predictability of people who are coming into your shelter, I think you can have different patterns than if you just have these, you know, certain amount of people for a certain amount of time. And so you have to kind of look at what is the traffic flow um, of who's coming and going, but creating you know, patterns around where does the animal go, where where can they be held, and then making sure that the pens are tall enough, covering the pens. So again, visual restriction where you might just hang sheets or towels over over the pen or over the crate can be really helpful to help dogs and cats feel safer because then people aren't walking right in towards them. More more questions about about. Uh, about that, you know, staff who are scared of dogs. I mean, I wouldn't force staff who are scared of dogs to work with them, but they actually also might be your best people because it'd be really easy for them to keep their hands to themselves. Whereas if you have an animal lover <laughs> and the dog comes in they're they're more likely to want to go pet. Um, and that isn't, you know, that isn't a, a good idea. Thanks. Questions. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so we have a question from Judy Ray, who's gearing up for a brand new shelter out in Kitsap County. So can you give us enrichment ideas for dogs inside the facility during foul weather? How much mm -hmm. do dogs need each day? Yeah, this is a great question. So, and I can tie this into, you know, animals coming, you know, into an animal shelter, but also animals who might be coming into um, an unhoused situation. Let's say when they come in for the evening, um, there's always a, I don't know, some type of food puzzle. So whatever you have on hand is fine. It could be cardboard boxes that you've saved. It could be empty egg cartons. It could be um, toilet paper tubes. And you can take um, dogs have different preferences. So some dogs like to shred, some dogs like to um, 
like solve puzzles and move things around. Some dogs like to sniff. So they have different preferences around what they enjoy. But if you were to, you know, pet parent comes in, their dog goes into a crate or a, some sort of a little pen that's covered. And inside that pen, there's a meal for them that has been put into some different puzzle toys. Um, you know, anything you have laying around, Obviously, we want to be careful because we might not know this population of dogs and some dogs will ingest things. That's why I'm a big fan of cardboard, because if they ingest it, it's it's going to it's more likely to come out the other end safely um, or really non-destructible dog toys. But those can be expensive, which is why I like egg cartons and cardboard boxes, because those are pretty easy to get. Um, so if they come into some sort of a food puzzle, then they immediately have an activity to do while the pet parent is getting their stuff situated or doing something like that. And the same thing with an animal shelter. Uh, again, animals like patterns and predictability. So as much routine as we can have. So immediately first thing in the morning, dogs need to get out and go potty. We instruct our staff at our animal shelter to, you know, if a dog has not gone to the bathroom in their kennel overnight, those are the priority dogs, though, because we know they've held it all night. And those are the dogs who are most likely to be already potty trained. So if somebody's already gone in their, in their in, you know, to the bathroom in their kennel and the dog next to them hasn't, they take the dog next to them first. Um, if you have enough staff, you can get everybody out at once. Great, but that's not usually the case. So you take those dogs out, they go out for potty. And then while those dogs are going out for potty, you have another team member, if possible, who's cleaning that kennel uh, while the dog's out, because that's really stressful to have the water spraying and the sounds. So you're really trying to reduce stressors. Somebody's coming into your space, messing up all your stuff, cleaning, filling your water bowl. Um, those things can be stressful. So the dog's out for a little walk, Get, gets to go to the bathroom, comes back to a clean kennel, and then there's another food. That'd be a really great time for an enrichment puzzle. So what we know about dogs is they would spend a great deal of time foraging for food. And so when we put it in a bowl, and it's like playing hide and seek without hiding. So what we want to do is take those that bowl of food that we're going to be feeding them anyways and find some way to make it a little bit more of a foraging exercise. So that could be putting it in, into Kongs, which are a dog toy you can pack with food, putting it in a cardboard box and then sealing it, um, you know, different, different things like that. So um, what I like to do is multiple, multiple puzzles so that you, you know, maybe they go to puzzle number one, and then they're done with that and they go to puzzle number two. So usually having a feeding station where there's multiple puzzles. So I'm going to be putting, instead of grabbing one bowl and putting the dog's meal into one bowl, I grab a tray. I put the dog's meal into five different containers and then that goes into their um, puzzle. So I really like enrichment activities after a walk, if you can management, ideally three times a day, if you can do two times a day, that would be that would be lovely. If you can only do one time a day, I would try to do it um, maybe a little bit later in the day. So they get a walk and then maybe two or three or four hours later, then they get an enrichment puzzle, then they get another walk. So it's kind of about a timing thing. When, when do the dogs tend to be more active? You might time it when adopters are more likely to come in. So the dogs are busy working on a puzzle and quiet. Um, but enrichment puzzles can be just so wonderful for keeping dogs quiet and calm when there are periods of time that you maybe need them to be, but there's more noise level. Yeah. Does that answer your question or does it create another question? Uh, thank you. That was great. Appreciate your advice. Yeah. There are, you know, what we want to think about for exercise with dogs is really, um, I mean, there's multiple things, but two or three are the most important. One is mental exercise. So working the dog's mind is just really important. And we can work the dog's mind by um, doing a training session, if that's possible. Or if we don't have time with that, we give them a food puzzle. They're working their mind on their own. They're um, having to solve something. They're having to, to do an activity that takes a period of time. Um, and then another way to work their mind is just to, you know, have people sit in the, the kennel with them and be close to them. You know, dogs and, 
and humans, they really have a very strong relationship. So it's, it's important just to have that quality time where somebody's sitting in their kennel with them and they get some snuggle time. And then the other side of, so we've got mental exercise. And then the other side we want to really think about is physical exercise. Are they getting enough physical exercise? You know, dogs who are living with someone who's unhoused are probably getting wonderful levels of exercise. Um, but a dog in a kennel who's awaiting a home and doesn't have one may be getting, you know, one, hopefully two, ideally three um, short walks a day. Um, and, and so that the, the physical exercise is, is just as important as the mental exercise. Yeah. All right, thank you, Jen. Um, so that actually segues nicely into another question that we have here. Um, you talked a lot about sort of enrichment and how that keeps dogs quiet. And that is a big concern for people who are running emergency shelters for humans where you have a lot of people that are, that maybe not are dog people, you know, um, and they're all sort of packed into uh, one place together. How mm -hmm. do we minimize dog barking? Is there anything additional that you would add beyond um, sort of the food puzzles and enrichment items? Yeah, for emergency shelters, um, we what, what I would recommend is visual barriers as much as you can. So that could be covering a crate with a sheet, or it could be hanging curtains, or it could be, um, if you can find them or get them donated, X pins are wonderful because they're, they're kind of heavy, but you can move them. Um, the only downside to X pins is they can fall over if they aren't properly set up, but having visual separation is really, really helpful where they cannot see each other. And, uh, and also, you know, thinking about how dogs are walking past each other. So if you have a dog in a crate and the door is facing this way, is every dog walking past them? I might just simply turn that crate, slide it two feet away from the wall so that the dog's crate is facing the wall so that when you're taking them, so that when they're, you know, looking out the most accessible window, they, they aren't seeing dogs walking by as much. So visual separation, visual barriers are really, really useful. Um, you know, really thinking about it from a dog's perspective. What are they, what are they seeing? Um, and then from there, thinking about smells. So smells, if you have cats in an area, we might want to try to as much as we can move them. Um, if you only have one room, you know, when we were, we had a fire here last year, um, and we were, our Humane Society was housing all the evacuations and in that situation, all of the dogs and cats were in one building because that's what we had the resources for. So all of the cats were on one side, all of the dogs were on the other side, and there was a visual barrier separating the two so the cats could not see the dogs. And again, we did the best we could in that situation. Um, it could just be hanging towels over the back of the cat crate so they just can't see. They're still going to smell the dogs but they're not going to be able to see them. So it's like we're taking away one, um, one, up, one stressor, right? If I can see them and smell them, then that's, more, that's scarier. But if I can just smell them, but I don't see them coming into my space, I feel safer. So as much as you can, try to separate them out. Um, and then you can use uh, pheromone diffusers if you can have access to them. Both Feelaway and Adaptil are pheromone diffusers. So Feelaway is for cats, Adaptil is for dogs, and it has a pheromone that there is some research to show that it can be useful. If you don't have access to that, then lavender or chamomile can provide a nice sort of scent, scent smell for both the humans and the dogs. Um, so maybe having an aerosol, you know, that you can just spritz around the room can be, can be useful. Um, and then thinking about traffic flow. So again, we don't want the dogs walking out past the cats and we don't want, you know, just anybody walking in and out of that space because, you know, there might be uh, safety issues around who is coming and, and going. Um, so the last shelter we ran um, we had one entry point and one exit point, 
And so if you were walking the dogs, you were going out one door and coming in another door. And what that allowed us to do for safety was um, in that situation, we were working with the Red Cross and the Red Cross was housing um, people who were evacuated in one building and then we were housing the pets. So those were totally separate, which there are pros and cons to as well. Um, but because there were a lot of people on site and we were at the fairgrounds, it's a fairly public place. We had one entry point so that we could see who was coming in. And then we had ID bands for the, the owners who had dogs there so we could check really quickly to see who was supposed to be there so that we didn't have any theft of the pets. So it depends on your situation, but um, what you really wanna think about is again, the visual, how can we reduce the visual and make sure that people aren't walking right at a dog or right at a cat? So if a kennel is right across the door and dogs, dogs are walking in at them, that's going to be scary. We want to think about the smells. You know, dogs have about 300 million olfactory sensors in comparison to our six. So they can smell everything. And so if you're using really, you know, bleach and really scented, um, cleaners, that can be very stressful. So thinking about what type of um, smells are in the environment, um, proximity to their pet parent usually decreases stress to be close to their pet parent. If you can, it isn't always possible. Um, and there's there, there are downsides to that. I think the upsides probably outweigh the downsides. I mean, the upsides you have, the pet is close to the pet parent and so the pet is going to feel safer. Usually the pet parent is, but now maybe you have a bunch of people housed in the same location and some don't have animals and there's a lot of noise and people aren't sleeping. And then you also have inexperienced handlers walking the dogs and potentially greeting dogs. Um, in the last you know, evacuation we were a part of, some of the owners couldn't walk their dogs. They physically weren't capable. Um, they were either wheelchair bound or their dogs were, had never been on a leash and they were too strong. So it was, it was in that situation, I think helpful to have them separate because we had experienced um, dog walkers from the shelter who were managing the dogs in and out of the space, which I think increased safety for that situation. But again, pros and cons. All right. Thank you, Jen. Um, I have another question here about a slightly different setup than what we had um, than what we have been talking about so far. So sometimes there are shelter environments where everyone is basically sharing one big room and there are cots or bunk beds or what have you sort of with no separation. Um, and then in other situations, you have actually sort of more apartment style um, shelter set settings and environments. Uh, so what are your suggestions for multiple families that are sharing an apartment with an owner and their pet? Mm. Um, so they would be, it would be multiple families all in one unit together. And one of the pet parents has a pet. Is that kind of the scenario? Yes. And um, D Pruden, if you're still with us, uh, are you able to unmute yourself and maybe give us a little bit more background or paint a picture for us of um, of what the environment looks like? Definitely. Good afternoon. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Hi, Jen. Hi, Christine. Hi. All right. Yeah. So I'm currently managing a shelter where um, clients are sharing an apartment. Sometimes there are two families in one apartment, sometimes three families in an apartment. Okay. We do have a few pets in the facility, uh, but one of my, um, I, I guess one of the things that, that we're trying to work around is um, having an owner with their pet in the apartment and making sure that that environment is not just safe, um, it's habitable, it's safe, uh, people sometimes have pet allergies. Mm -hmm. um, we want to make sure that everyone is okay because it's not just my space, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I want to make sure when, when we're talking about providing services, I have to look at every single client. All right. Yeah. Um, so I want to make sure that I'm 
taking pets into the facility, but in doing so, I'm also meeting the needs of every other resident and every other client that's Mm. housed in the facility. So how do you, um, like, I don't know if there's some best practices. One of the things we have started to do is ask roommates, are you comfortable with having a pet in the apartment with you? Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, what are some of your barriers? Um, Mm -hmm. Sometimes roommates will say things like, well, what type of dog is it? Um, Because, or what type of pet is it? Um, And and one of the other things we recently accepted, a a family came into shelter and they had mice for Mm -hmm. a pet. Um, (laughs) And so... (laughs) Yeah, we're in New York. Yeah, Yeah. I'm so glad. We're in New York, and we're in the Bronx, and there's a river not too far from my facility. Um, So, so, and we've also had to, (laughs) we have to manage this throughout most shelters. Yeah. Uh, So I did have to step back and move outside of my own biases, Mm -hmm. um, and look at this as a pet. Mm -hmm. Um, so what are some of your suggestions (laughs) well uh, first of all I love that and I I really am so grateful for just this conversation because pets do mean so much to their caregiver you know they really do provide a sense of security um they a lot they provide an opportunity for the, the the person to provide caregiving um And, you know, that unconditional love that we don't always find somewhere else. So even in the smallest little friend, um, which, by the way, is very economical to feed. uh, So it's kind of a good choice um, and and fairly portable. You know, I think that that's wonderful. I really loved um, at this year's Clicker Expo, which is a, a, a conference that Karen Pryor Academy puts on. They had this lovely um, sticker system that you would put on your name tag. And it was, if you put a red sticker on, it meant that you did not like hugging. You were not a hugger. Uh, Yellow, and I can't remember, maybe I think Sarah's on here. So if I'm getting it wrong, she can uh, put it in the chat. Yellow was like, ask first. And then green was like, I'm all in. I want all the hugs. And I just, I loved that because it was a really easy way for you to quickly identify the person's comfort level. And And so maybe you could have some sort of a system like that when people are filling out their application, you know, are you, you know, absolutely no to pets, you're a a red dot. Are you like, I'm neutral, but I want to know about the size, I'm yellow, Um, or I'm green, like I love everything, including mice. And you could even potentially apply that to the pet um, and ask the pet parent, is your dog or your cat, you know, um, an introvert, they, they just like their person and, and their immediate circle or, and they're a red sticker. Are they kind of yellow? Like they take a little while to warm up, but they eventually do. Are they green? They are a complete extrovert. They love everybody, all people. And now sometimes this is where knowing about body language can come in handy because some pet parents will say, my dog is an extrovert and the dog is not. So you do have to um, maybe ask the dog by watching their body language a little bit, but maybe having some sort of simple system like that, that might be helpful to to know where you could place people um, or just asking them, like you were saying, what's your comfort level? Um, Because you might be able to create, you know, but bring families together who really love that and they haven't been able to have a pet. And now they get to, they have kids who get to help care for the pet. Um, so you might create some nice situations if you compare people that way. Uh, and it could be really nice if you have a pet parent who has separation anxiety and animal separation anxiety can't be left alone. And so if they're living in a community with, uh, you know, two or other fam- two or three other families, they might be able to go grocery shopping or go uh, be able to go you know, outside 10 minutes by themselves or do things on their own that they could not do without another family. So it could be a really nice opportunity. Yeah. Hopefully that answers your question. That's a, that's a tricky one. Yeah. All right. 
Well, thank you, Jen. And I just want to reiterate some of the things that have already come up. So those dog behavior posters would be great in an apartment style setting. Mm -hmm. um, you can print them out and, and post them um, so that everyone who lives in that apartment has easy access to the, the that visual. Um, I have actually seen some dog leashes and collars that are labeled mm -hmm. um, that say like, friendly or I need space or something like that. And so those are obviously like a little bit more um, of an investment. They cost a little bit more than your average leash and collar, but uh, that might be something to look into. And then also just the importance of enrichment items and, um, and ways to keep the dog quiet. So they're not stressed and bored or right. afraid. Yeah. And you could maybe even, you know, if you can't get, there are things that go on the leash, which are nice, but maybe it's just a bandana and you have red, yellow, and green bandanas that, that people get, or, um, you know, some sort of way to just very easily and non-judgmentally identify. So the person can see, I know I have a lot of clients who have dogs who are fearful of people and it really takes a lot of pressure off of them saying no, when the dog is wearing a vest that says in training, um, it, it just, they, people see that and they know, oh, that dog is this. And so they are more likely to stop and ask questions before they just go right in and pet. So having some sort of visual identifier can be really helpful. Um, yeah. Yep. Um, Wendy in the chat um, says that her shelter has a turtle in it and that's just wonderful. Um, oh, that's great. That was in response to the comment that you have mice um, at your shelter right now. Um, I I did in prep for this event, I did talk with Jen about um, her ability to answer questions about other types of animals, but I was not anticipating mice or turtles. Um, <laughs> Talk briefly about like cats and even horses, but um, I love that we're getting comments about turtles and mice. Yeah. Um, so here's another pretty a heavy question, a big ticket one that I do actually hear fairly often. Um, this was pre-submitted in the registration form. How, how do we do an intake on a fearful and unsocialized dog when they enter a congregate shelter environment? Are there dogs that just will not do well in shelter, uh, in shelter period? And mm -hmm. How do we identify them and find alternate solutions? Sorry, Jen, that's mm -hmm. actually three questions rolled yeah. in. <laughs> that's all right. I'm gonna I'm gonna tackle it. And then if when if I don't have answers to some of the questions, you can type them into the chat or unmute. Um, you know, that's a tricky one because dogs coming in, especially for the first time, will have a different response potentially than they would after having been there for a week or two. Um it isn't uncommon for dogs when they come into an unfamiliar environment to be um, what we might uh, term shut down. So they just seem a little more uh, like quiet and stoic and they just, um, they seem great. Uh, as they get comfortable in that environment, then they're, they might be a little more reactive or they might be a little bit more likely to bark. And um, and so sometimes you won't necessarily know, so it might be better to have just some very simple things in place that um, determine where the dog is being housed. So for example, um, if a pet parent, if you have a rule of we aren't allowing dogs to greet other dogs and you have a pet parent who is continuously doing that, then you maybe have to go to another tier of saying, you know, creating a place like over there at that field, if you want to greet other dogs with your dog, that's where you can do it. Um, so you might have to have some tiers like that where you can have an alternative plan. Um, but there are dogs that do not do well in animal shelters. There are not, there are dogs that are probably not going to do well in a crowded situation with a lot of other people. And you're not necessarily going to know that right away. Um, so having other resources or creating partnerships, you know, a lot of animal shelters, you know, ours in particular has resources with rescues, um, but that would again be for an animal that doesn't have a pet parent. If you have an animal that does have a pet parent, you might have some kennels that are outside away from where people are sleeping so as an alternative, you do have a place that you could put a dog and lock it so that it doesn't get stolen or get out. Um, 
and they, you know, that's plan B. You know, plan A is the dog is with the pet parent, sleeping next to them um, in a crate or in an X pen. With small dogs, I like to elevate the crate so that it's close to the bed, so close to the pet parent, so they're maybe eye to eye um, if possible. Um, and with larger dogs, obviously that's a little bit less necessary because they're already eye to eye because they're bigger. Um, so that might be plan A is the dog comes in and, you know, our shelter, they have bunk beds, so they have a top and bottom. So, uh, pet parents with, um, pets get the bottom and then there's a crate right next to it or an X pen that's right next to it. So again, we have that pattern of the dog comes in, they go to that location, they go to that location, they get a food puzzle. And then the pet parent can situate their stuff. And if that same pattern is repeating every time, the dog will start to get the routine um, after a week or so. If it changes every time, that's a little bit harder, I think, both for the human and for the and for sure for the dog. Um, so having some simple um, flow charts or strategies that you're like this, you go here and then you go here and then you go here is really helpful. Um, you know, things that you can think about, and I know somebody was asking about how do you, how do you medicate, um, upon intake? Do you medicate, um, you know, are when you're in the room, so let's say we have, a, um, uh, a staff member in the room talking to the pet parent, you know, does the dog approach you with a relaxed body or does it stay really, really far away? Or is it really, really, really barking? those behaviors that you're seeing right away are going to guide you onto where we might need to put this dog first. If we have a dog who's smushed into the corner, hiding underneath the chair, completely quiet, they we might try to put them in a quieter corner of the shelter that's lower traffic. Um, if we have a dog who's barking at us right away, um, it could be that they're just really stressed out and they've never been inside. But we might really think they also need a quieter corner, but they also probably need to be maybe close to a door so that they can get outside quickly to a bigger space. Or um, maybe they need a bigger area. You know, maybe if there's a higher concentration of beds in this place, in this location, or there's a higher traffic rate in this location, maybe we want to put them somewhere else. So those are some things that we might think about, about the shy dog that's really shut down versus the um the reactive dog who's who's more offensively barking and right away, you know, thinking about strategically, we need to reduce the visual stimuli, reduce noise, um, and think about quick quick entry and exit, as well as do they have the proper equipment on the dog? So that that is tricky too because a pet parent might not have the right leash or they might not have a secure collar. Um, and so having donations for those that so you can have those on hand can be really helpful as well. Um, another thing that I, that I was thinking about, and this kind of ties into that is, you know, we have talked a lot about what can the dog see, what can the dog smell, but sound is also a really big contributor to stress. And, um, so having fans, having white noise, having music or something that's playing can be really, really helpful to creating a, a calmer environment. With fans, the nice thing about that, it's kind of disrupting the airwaves a little bit. So that tends to provide a little bit better um, noise desens or noise um, um, blocking than just having like a white noise machine might. But um, those are all things, that's another thing that you can kind of think about how noisy is this location? And could I put a little fan next to this person's space to just provide a little bit of continuous um, sound disruption? Yeah. All right, thank you, Jen. I am gonna circle back around to a question or a couple of questions that we got at the very beginning. I think it was from Heather. Um, and the reason why I put a pin in this question is because I feel like it's a little bit outside the, the wheelhouse of behavior. It's more about mm -hmm. policies and um, maybe some other practices around cleaning and fleas and immunization. But Jen would still love your input if you have any. Um, so the questions are, in a shelter environment, how do you handle allergies, as well as handling things like fleas and immunization? Um, so I'm I'm gonna start with just a couple of 
tips and tricks that we've picked up at My Dog is My Home from the practices that are employed by shelters across the country that we've worked with. And then Jen, if there's anything that you want to add, would love to would love to have you jump in as well. Great. Uh, so allergies is one of those big questions that um, you know it's like fear of dog bites and then allergies um, that really stop homeless shelters from moving forward with co-sheltering. Um, so allergies, there's really not like a great silver bullet answer that I can give, but I can say that some of the practices, the cleaning protocols that have come from just like COVID era, you know, um, precautions, um, those actually can really help. So just regular cleaning, um, also having air filtration and open windows can help. Um, if you have a, a small like portable HEPA air filter that you can keep in the area, that can also be really useful. Um, lint rollers, as simple as that sounds, having lint rollers um, available across the shelter and in staff offices can be useful. Um, and then also taking a look at the type of uh, flooring that you have, which might be a little bit more of, a, of an investment there. But um, if you have a carpeted facility, uh, that may just need to be vacuumed more often versus a concrete floor or a linoleum floor. Um, so those are the practices around allergies uh, that I have for you. Handling things like fleas and immunization. So immunization is the one that I want to really address off the bat. Um, so we do at My Dog is My Home recommend that um, your shelter have uh, not a requirement, but some guidelines around supporting basic immunizations and the animals that come through the door. However, we're still big proponents of just like low barrier entry and mm -hmm. folks who are experiencing homelessness um, may have not had the opportunity to get regular uh, veterinary care for their animals, or maybe their vaccines just aren't up to date. And so don't let the vaccines really stop you from um, allowing that family or that person and their animal enter shelter together. Um, our recommendation is that you um, follow regular practices for intake uh, with that person and the animal so that they have as quick of an entry into the program as possible. And then from there, you support them in getting that veterinary care so that their vaccines are up to date. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I agree. The low barrier and, and, but it is an opportunity to create a relationship. And what we found at the last, um, a couple of different things that we've done here that have been really um, interesting is that when we had the, the fire evacuations, it was in an area that was particularly low income. And a lot of these dogs were, came in with health issues, um, specifically flea allergies. And so it was actually really wonderful because we had, because our shelter has veterinary um, support, these animals coming in were actually able to get care that they would not have otherwise been able to get, but it wasn't a barrier to them coming in. So they come in, they were there, and then we were working with the pet parent to say, hey, would you like, we have these things that we can do, would you like these, these, these things. So flea, flea care. Um, one dog had a minor surgery that it needed. Um, and, and so it was really a nice opportunity to provide some care for those pets. Um, and so finding organizations that you can work for, we have an organization here called pro bono, and we also have another organization called community veterinary care, and they both provide no cost services to, um, you know, people who can't afford it. And so they work with the shelter to bring those services on certain times, um, which is which is really a nice opportunity to provide care. So I agree, minimize um, the barriers to access. Yeah. And everything you said about allergies was great. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, so we do have one last question here, which is a big one. Um, this will be our last question that we're able to address today. So from M. Jupiter, can the program be liable for any injury another client sustained from a pet residing in the program? Um, I think that's a little bit outside of the, the behavior realm as well. It's more of a, a 
policy liability issue that you may want to go over with your program's general counsel, um, also with your insurance carrier. Um, and so unfortunately, I sort of have to leave it at that because it is such an individualized thing that's um, that really should be dis discussed on like a high level at your organization. Um, but also feel free to reach out to me if there's something about what I said that leaves something to be desired. I would be happy to just like go over that in a little bit more detail with you um, and we can talk offline about that. So with that, I do have to close up the event. Um, but before we, go, before we go, I do wanna put two upcoming events on everyone's radar. So our quarter two co-sheltering collaborative meeting is coming up this Thursday at 3.30 p.m. Eastern time. It's on Zoom. Uh, if you don't already get our meeting invites, please sign up at the link in the chat to be added to the email list. And I will go ahead and drop that in there right now for everyone. Um, so the co-sheltering collaborative, for those of you who are not already familiar with it, it's our peer-to-peer -peer learning network. And so you have an opportunity to join other providers who have either already been co-sheltering for a really long time or other providers who are brand new to the issue, um, all sort of just gathering together on Zoom to troubleshoot and exchange practices and tips and resources. So it's a really great environment and um, network to be a part of. This Thursday, we have Sandy Howell from The Kong Company joining us. It's a great follow-up to uh, this session because Sandy will be talking along the lines of dog behavior, but focusing specifically on enrichment, which we learned today is so important for creating a healthy, safe co-sheltering environment. Um, so some of the dog behaviors that you all are worried about in a congregate living environment can stem from boredom. And Sandy will go over some very helpful tips and tricks to avoid bored and stressed dogs in your shelter environment. Um, also, for anyone who's joining us from Ohio, from northern Kentucky, or other parts of the Midwest that are close-ish to Cincinnati, uh, our next open house will be taking place in Cincinnati on Friday, August 4th. So that's an in-person event. This is an opportunity for you all to learn about and tour a fully pet-inclusive, permanent, supportive housing site that is owned and operated by a homeless services provider. Registration for the open house uh, will be available this week. So please keep your eyes peeled for that in our newsletter if you're from that part of the country. So with that, um, thank you so much to Jen for sharing her time and expertise with us. Uh, thank you to everyone who is here and who has been engaged during the office hours. If you still have questions that you'd like to workshop, please feel free to reach out to me for additional support. My Dog is My Home also highly, highly recommends that any organization that is involved in co-sheltering build a relationship with a local reputable dog trainer. And if you need help identifying a dog trainer in your area, again, please feel free to reach out to me. I can help you do a search. Um, and we have relationships with some really great national kind of dog training entities that can help with that as well. My email address will be dropped in the chat. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. I hope to see you all on Thursday for the Co-Sheltering Collaborative meeting. Thank you, Christine. Thank Have you. a good day, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.